Isaac, is there still any point in um, wearing the jersey if the chances are all but but gone, basically? Oh, there's plenty of chances. If it, uh, it ain't over till the fat lady sings. That's what they say. But yeah, no, I mean, we, we could definitely win. You never know. Who, um, like, in the game yesterday, what would you say? Was it, like, Skinner's fault? Was it, like, McDavid's? Like, what went wrong? Uh, the team is just so bad in the defensive zone with giveaways. Uh, Bouchard's the worst for it, but they had a, a – he wasn't the only culprit. But they did play good in the third, I thought, when they – I literally genuinely believed they were going to come back. And uh, obviously, they got pretty close because we were down 4-1 and then to 4-3. And we uh, – a couple cl clear penalties in the last two minutes that weren't called, so that might have helped. But our, pen our power play hasn't been good, so – uh, Rachel, you sounded it. like the least convincing sports reporter ever there. Like you just Googled <laughs> two names and asked a question that you think is what you ask a sports fan. Listen, I knew two names of people on the team. Like that's a pretty impressive improvement for me like two years ago. Yeah. No, it's easy because it, the thing when you talk about sports fans is they all have strong opinions on things. So you just have to ask one generic question and they'll think that you know a lot more than you do. Like, I was like, wow, Rachel knows so much. It was such a good question. No, no, line and, oh, yeah, don't get me started on that. Being, and it's being like, a sports reporter would be the easiest thing ever. Like, how do you feel about tonight's game? Is there anyone in the crowd for you right now? What do you guys have to do better next week? Like, I could do it. I have never watched yeah. a full game of sports in my life, but I could probably do it. Yeah, you could also do that uh, covering the NDP leadership race in Alberta. Uh, all right, let's get this started, guys. Welcome to Off the Record on True North. This is the more casual show of our lineup. We kick back and have a rotating roster of the cast of characters you know and love. Well, certainly that you know from True North. We talk about the things from the week that have stuck with us, the things that maybe we didn't get a chance to talk about. And uh, today I am, I'm Andrew Lawton, by the way. Hi, nice to see you. Uh, today I am joined by my colleague, Rachel Emanuel, host of Alberta Roundup, and also Isaac Lamaru, who does a daily brief from time to time and is also a uh, key member of our Alberta Bureau situated in the uh, capital of Alberta over in Edmonton. So uh, welcome to you both. It's good to have you. Isaac, I see you rocking the uh, the Oilers uh, the Oilers jersey today. I, I care in, in no way about this, but I respect that you care about it and are probably quite unhappy today. So I'm glad that you are. I, I'm glad that you licked your wounds enough to join us. Yeah, well, it's even like last night. I was like, "Hey, I'm just happy to be here, Stanley Cup Finals." Uh, no one could have guessed that we'd we'd have made it this far. So, it, if worse comes to worse, at least we got into the finals. <laughs> now, Rachel, is the token Calgarian like? Do people from Calgary who generally hate the Oilers want them to succeed because they're an Alberta team, or does the hatred transcend even when they're in the finals? My limited impression of things as someone who is not largely a sports fan is that once the flames are out, everyone kind of gets on board and cheers for the Canadian team. Because still, you know, it's still better to have a Canadian team win and an Albertan team win, no less, than the Florida Panthers. Yeah, and I see there's the, I can't remember if we talked about it last week, there's this like outstanding bet between Danielle Smith and uh, Ron DeSantis that's over, uh, I forget, it's like it's, there's a key lime pie involved in it now, it's, I don't know, these things are very, I know they're fun and they're nice and they're lighthearted, they also come across as a bit hokey at times, but uh, I would never turn down if Ron DeSantis wanted to send me a key lime pie, I would never turn it down, so, well, or if I anyone think wants to. we're going to be sending him, I believe it's Alberta whiskey, because if, yeah. if we lose, if we somehow can turn this around and win, he's going to be sending, sending up some Florida rum, and he said he would throw in. Some okay, that, that was it. All right. So sending sending down some Alberta whiskey, some frozen steaks, who knows what else is going to go there. Um, all right. <laughs> that, believe it or not, I did not choose sports as a lead story. That was just the chit chat phase of the program here. Although we do have a political sports crossover story we'll get to in just a couple of moments. But I, I want to start things off by talking about the NDP, which has been, as we know, propping up the Liberal government for uh, basically the last five years, but in particular since the 2021 election with this so-called supply and confidence agreement, the NDP is finally starting to get some pressure from journalists on why they do this. It's become, a, if you watch my show, you'll hear this. It's my favorite pastime now. Find an example of Jagmeet Singh saying that, you know, the liberals are failing Canada and they're doing this wrong and this wrong. And then just pointing out that, uh, well, you know, he could pull his support from the liberals literally at any moment and chooses not to. Uh, as we saw, though, members of the uh, House of Commons press gallery were not wanting to let him slide. Take a look. 
So why are you continuing to prop up the government who you say isn't taking democracy seriously? Why do you continue to prop them up? So the question is, what are we going to do no, about it? No, the, the question, the question is, to why me, do you continue to prop up the government when you say our democracy is at stake and this government is not taking our democracy seriously? Why continue to back them up? We're not at all doing that. What we're saying is we're going to demand answers. We're going to continue to push for solutions. Because we're in Parliament right now, I was able to read these documents. Because we're in Parliament now, we've been able to push for a letter to have the public inquiry also include the Conservative leadership race in uh, a part of the public inquiry's work. We want to use the tools as, as parliamentarians, as, as a parliamentarian myself, to use the tools that we have, that I have, to advance People democracy. I want to use the tools that I have to get to the bottom of this. Uh, the, the suggestion that an election is a solution to election interference is, I think, a fallacy. What we need to do is use the tools we have to get to the bottom of this. I want to continue to push for more solutions. I want to push for more transparency. I want to push to learn more so we can have better solutions. Ooh, okay, so now the argument is, well, we can't have an election because that's not the answer to election interference. So I, I love it. He's saying that he's not propping up the liberal governments. Where are all these like political reporter fact checkers that like to fact check the simplest things that conservative politicians say? Uh, Rachel, what's your take on this? You know, I'm so tired of talking about Jagmeet Singh because he's such an unimpressive politician. But we have to because he's pretty much responsible for propping up the Liberal government at this point and continuing. Well, he's not pretty much. He is responsible. Yeah, he is. I was going to say you were couching it there. <laughs> yeah, for, you know, for the sort of the situation that we're in in Canada where, you know, Liberals are tanking the polls, but we aren't having an election. We can all thank him for that. You know, it's just he, he but he kind of cracks me up. Like you can see why he has this likability factor, especially for his base of people. He's so utterly unfazed. This reporter's yelling at him and he's just kind of like, hmm. Yeah, you know, he's blinking along. He's like, yeah, you know, um, we need to ask questions. His answer is pretty much the same. He gives the same platitudes no matter what the topic is. He doesn't actually seem that interested or that engaged in the job. He doesn't seem to get riled up about any issues. He just has these same sort of talking points that he defers back to time and time again. So, you know, I think maybe the fact that we're seeing some pressure from the media up in Ottawa could be a really good thing. Maybe that could be the thing that finally gets the NDP, you know, thinking as to whether or not they want to continue propping up the Liberal government. At the end of the day, money talks. And if they're not financially ready to be in a position to go to the election, that's going to continue. That's going to have them continue keeping the position that they're keeping now, which is say one thing to the media, have a lot of talk about demanding answers, but behind closed doors, it's a totally different story. Your word, Isaac. Yeah, uh, so I watched the whole conference of Singh, which is about 22 minutes or so. And despite reporters consistently asking him about things that were in the unredacted version of the report, it was very clear the rules, I suppose, that were around that because any question that they asked, he would just say, oh, the public report said X, Y, or Z. So that's basically what he can say. So he didn't really say anything new regarding the unredacted version of the report, although what I did find very interesting was that it was clear he disagreed with Elizabeth May because he mm -hmm. said, quote, he was more alarmed than yesterday after reading the report uh, compared to prior to reading it, whereas she was saying, oh, there's nothing to be worried about. There, There's no one. Uh, there's no list of MPs, whereas Singh said there is clearly a list of traitors within uh, Canadian Parliament. So I, I, I was very confused about that. And, I, and even the reporters are saying, did you guys read two different versions of the report? Like, how is this possible? Yeah. By the way, Isaac, when you lean forward, your left eye is getting okay. like caught off by the frame. You've got to, you've got to remain centered both ideologically. And, well, maybe not <laughs> ideologically, but uh, remain, remain grounded ideologically Very and hard. centered uh, in terms of the framing. But uh, <laughs> the, the joys of doing live to tape is that uh, we don't just edit it out after. It's like, Isaac, your eye disappeared. Anyway. Um, yeah, no, you're right. And, and the whole thing was Elizabeth May comes out and basically says, oh, yeah, I've got no worries about every anyone. Everything's fine. It's great. And then he comes out and it's like, oh, yeah, definitely there was something that happened here. <laughs> 
And, you know, is this, you know, two people reading the same report? Is it two people just skimming it? And or is it two people that had their own conclusions? I mean, Elizabeth May basically running cover for the liberals in her answer. Jugmeet Singh trying to do this weird sort of crossover of, well, I'm being tough. I'm being the tough guy. I'm being the strong man. But also, uh, absolutely, I'm not, uh, you know, just shilling for the liberal. Like it's it was this weird, weird line that he was trying to straddle. And I don't think he does it all that well. But it's what he tries to do every day, where on one hand, he's pretending to be this watchdog on the government. And on the other hand, he's the government lapdog. Yeah. And I think with these leaders now having come out and spoken to the reports, we have more questions and answers. Very baffling that we're hearing such different things about what's actually contained in this report. Of course, you know, conservative leader Pierre Polyev has so far declined to receive this briefing. Andrew, do you think that's the right move for him at this point, especially now we have May, we have Singh giving totally different interpretations of it. It's caused more confusion than anything. Um, this way, you know, Polly, if he's kind of able to stay above the fray and, and demand answers publicly, or do you think, you know, there's been a lot of pressure from him. I've been watching CTV, Global News. There's been a lot of criticism on Polyev for not having received this briefing and everyone saying, well, the other leaders are doing it. He's going to be forced to do it. Or do you think that it's actually the right move from him at this point to just say, I don't want to see something that uh, I won't be able to talk about publicly? Yeah, I, I get why he's I get why he's made the decision. And interestingly, Thomas Mulcair, who's the former NDP leader, he did an interview on CTV. I think it was yesterday or two days ago. And in that interview, he was talking about how he wouldn't do it if he were the leader, because he really takes the Polyev position on this, that he doesn't want to be bound and gagged so that he's reading about stuff that he then can't talk about, which means he can't fulfill his role as the opposition leader. Now, I, I think so that I understand the point. I also don't know if the messaging is working for Polyev right now because he is getting criticized about this every day. There is this conspiracy theory on Twitter that, oh, the reason he's not reading the report is because he can't get security clearance. He's, you know, there's some weird schedule. So that it's, but it's allowed that to happen by not just reading it. So I think ultimately the calculation is, What's a greater political cost? Not being able to hold the government to account on this, not being able to talk about this report, or the flip side of that, which is people wondering why you're not and people criticizing you for not. So I, I think that's really what it comes down to. Isaac? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree agree with you, Andrew, that it's a double-edged sword for Polyevka, obviously. And I should say that his strategy, in my opinion, to date has really been to um, just kind of stay grounded, uh, especially like take immigration for an example, you know, he doesn't really want to speak about it because I guess he thinks that the liberal party will probably just dig their own grave, uh, for lack of a better figure of speech. Uh, right. So I don't know. Yeah. It, that's the thing. There's, there's pros and cons to, to reading or not reading the report. Uh, and it's hard to say without him having done it, which is the better option, in, in my opinion. So I said earlier there was going to be a sports tie-in in the sense that it ties into the Oilers game last night, but not really the game itself. But Isaac, take it away. Yeah, so Paul Lievre, uh aired... Uh, really, really uh, Frenching up the pronunciation today. We're used to the Anglo, uh, just Paul Liev. You're doing it the I know, I, I'm, I know, I always just pronounce it in the French way, and I, I've kind of been doing that for a while, so I... I Usually just stick with that. <laughs> Anyways, he aired an ad uh, uh, essentially showing what Trudeau has done to the country over the last nine years, uh, which was a 30-second ad. And it allegedly aired on Sportsnet and CBC, which I thought was going to be the debut, by the way. But Polyevra actually released the ad on X and other social platforms a few hours before the game. So it wasn't technically a, a hmm. debut per se. Anyways, yeah, so the ad is, it was about 30 seconds long, and every five, well, sorry, the ad starts Why, why don't with, we uh, just take a look at it first? Yeah, sure. It's time for a change in this country, my friends. A real change! 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 Yeah, that was better. I, I was just going to sit there explaining the ad, but it's like, I guess we could just show it. <laughs> a video's worth a thousand pictures. A picture's worth a thousand words. 
I will say, though, I was watching the game on uh, the Sportsnet app, so not the televised version I- exactly. Uh, so it was the app on, on the TV, like Sportsnet now. Uh, and I didn't see the ad play at all, although I was away from the TV during the first intermission. So if it played at some point when I was away from the TV during the first intermission, I didn't catch it. But I did see that it was supposed to play on Sportsnet and surprisingly CBC as well. So yeah, how much of a surprise is that to you, Andrew, that an ad like this would play uh, on CBC? I I don't think it's a surprise. I mean, yes, CBC is CBC, but when they're airing a hockey game, it's a bit of a different audience than the audience of, you know, Power and Politics or Little Mosque on the Prairie or Heartland or something like that. So I, I don't think it's CBC. I mean, yes, it's it's a bit ironic that the conservatives who say they are going to defund CBC are now funding CBC with ad dollars. And I, I don't actually know how much the the ad costs, but it's part of a campaign that's going to air in, you know, different markets. It's probably going to air on digital. I, I, I'm kind of curious about the ad itself because I actually thought just from a production perspective, it was a brilliant concept just taking the before and after photos of the identical places and these scenes and showing just the devolution of Canadian cities into tent cities. And I know uh, it's, you know, different provinces. It's not just BC, like we always used to think of here. It was, it was Edmonton, Ontario, you know, Alberta, Ontario, British Columbia, everywhere. And we have Halifax, this beautiful idyllic oceanside town is uh, also similarly seeing this. Uh, What did you think on that, Rachel? The ad was exceptionally well done and it was very powerful. And I think it speaks to something that all of us who have been living in Canada and who have observed what's going on in our country over the last decade have felt very, you know, very closely and near and dear to our hearts. The crisis, the cost of living crisis is impacting all of Canadians. And, you know, I think one of the effects of that that we're seeing is this homelessness crisis, which is, of course, also tied to things like addiction. And, you know, that goes back to the COVID-19 pandemic, people not being able to see each other. That's when we saw the addiction crisis really go through the roof. I've been visiting family in Ontario, and I think when it comes to seeing homelessness and when you see those people, you know, at the streetlights asking for money, we're really quick to sort of tune it out. Maybe you're one of the people who rolls down your window and and passes, um, you know, a bit of money. But I think by and large, people roll up their window, they lock their car doors, and they kind of just ignore it. And being home and being in St. Catharines and seeing the places where I spent so much time growing up, you know, there was always those problematic pockets of the city. Those aren't really a thing anymore. The problem parts of the city have really spread to every intersection. There's pretty much someone standing at every street corner along the highways, along medians, asking for money. And it just, I think now that I've been home and I've seen it in where I grew up, it's really just stunned me what the effect of this crisis has been and how many people are suffering. And when you stop to look at these people, it's such an obvious display of human suffering. And I think it's a shame on us as a nation that it's gotten as bad as it has and that we haven't been doing a better job of reaching these people and helping and pulling them out of their addictions. Sometimes when I talk about addiction and homelessness on my show, the occasional yields are, oh, that's really cruel that you, you know, you don't want home homelessness. No, it's not cruel. I actually think these people can have a better life and that we can put an arm down for them and and pull them out of this and offer them a better life than, you know, a cold spot on the ground. I don't think that's cruel at all to say that. That should not be controversial whatsoever. And so I think this ad just depicts the fact that under Justin Trudeau, the suffering in our nation is so strong. It's worse than ever. Uh, Yeah. And I mean, I always take the view on this. You you can't put the blame 100% on on one person, but especially with drug issues and homelessness issues, these are all very interconnected. You have provincial policy, municipal policy, federal policy, you have all of this. And, you know, at a certain point, though, you have to look at the federal government's role in it. And, you know, the federal government, which was permitting these drug legalization pilot projects that have proven to be an abysmal failure. And the federal government, which anytime someone talks about finding a different way, like Danielle Smith or uh, some conservative politicians, they all talk about it as being this lack of compassion. When in reality, I kind of take your view, which is that certainly there's nothing compassionate about that. There's nothing compassionate about these tent cities where people are, you know, dealing with addiction generally and having it go untreated. And the silence suggests everyone agrees with me. Uh, Isaac, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I, taking it back to the production value uh, of the ad, uh, uh, in my opinion, Polyevra, not only in this ad, but in his previous uh, videos that he's released, like Detonation comes to mind and, and, the, and the one before that, you know, they're, they're so... There's such high quality production that I really think that that plays a big role. For example, 
uh, something we didn't talk about it, that it happened in the ad was the constant echoing of of the first clip they showed where we're trying. yeah change real change and then yeah. with the lightning and and the storm in the background you know I thought that was a, a nice touch to the ad uh, so yeah I I, I got to say whoever's producing um, Polyafka's content uh, is is doing a fine job. <laughs> Well, that kind of raises in my mind the question of, I wonder how much of a hand, if any, Polly have had in this. To go back to Andrew Lawton's book, he, you know, a political, pair, pair Polly have a political life. You explained how much work um, Polyev has done in really honing his communication skills over the years that he's been first starting out as, you know, a young staffer and then eventually becoming an MP and of course now leader of the opposition and just how he really honed those skills on YouTube and on Twitter. So I'm just curious, I don't know if you have any thoughts, Andrew, on whether you think he had a hand in this video and the production of it. I So I, the, the sense that I got, now this was during the leadership race and people told me with, you know, fairly good authority that nothing went out that he didn't approve. Now, I don't know if that's the same now, you know, as far as individual tweets and stuff. I, I would be very surprised if he was looking at every tweet and uh, say, actually, for I don't think he is because there was one last week on, on D-Day. He posted a tweet and I, our Harrison Faulkner, our, co our colleague, was like railing against him on this one. And he like had a picture of American soldiers on Omaha Beach, not Canadian soldiers on Juneau Beach. So I don't think Paulie has a history, Bob. I don't think he would have let that one slide if he had seen it. But I think on big stuff like this and on core messaging stuff, he would absolutely have a say in it. Now, I mean, look, for all I know, and I have no idea whatsoever, the idea of the before and after might have been his. I don't know. But I, I, I think certainly, even though this ad wasn't a Polyev ad, it was an anti-Trudeau ad, I think he is setting the tone. And I think that he's trying to be very clear to Canadians, like point to a part of Canada that is better now than it was a decade ago. And that's actually a difficult question for people to answer in the affirmative. Yeah, I can't think of anything. I mean, we're more aware of the problem now, but, but that's always the cop out when the only way you can find like a positive spin on something is to say, well, you know, we're, we're more aware of how bad it is. Isaac, you seem to be thinking, have you, what, what's better no. in your life? Well, not your life, but better in the, in the country than it was a decade ago. I was thinking really hard and I was like, hey, maybe the territories are somehow better. But no, I mean, with the cost of goods and how they've maybe the their, answers their, up their in the screen. Yukon. Yeah. Somewhere. I was like, maybe the Nunav maybe Nunavut's gotten better. No, it, it hasn't. <laughs> yeah, that's too funny. Yeah, it's uh, it's certainly an interesting one. Um, there was this, uh, just to go back to the Jagmeet Singh uh, thing for a second, the media is getting a heck of a lot feistier with a lot of these people. And I think this is a good segue into the clip that you brought to us, uh, Rachel. Yeah, so this week, Vashi Capello's grilled finance minister, uh, Christy Freeland on the capital gains tax the Liberals have introduced. We'll just play the clip now because, as Andrew said, a video is a thousand pictures, um, just to give you a good sense of how that played out. From your perspective, this is about sound economic policy or about cornering the Conservatives? Sound economic policy. Why? Because we believe in fairness for every generation. The things you're talking about, though, dental care, Canada child benefit, daycare, they tally up to far more on an annual basis than this will bring in over five billion years. Why are you presenting it as a panacea to all that? I'm not presenting it as a panacea, but I am presenting it as a meaningful way to raise money to fund the things that Canadians need. I think you did present it as a panacea. I'm going to challenge the, the way that you're framing that based on your comments on Sunday. I'll read them directly to you. Do you want to live in a country where those at the very top live lives of luxury, but must do so in gated communities behind ever higher fences, using private health care and airplanes because the public sphere is so degraded and the wrath of the vast majority of their less privileged compatriots burns so hot? This is going to fix all that. And what responsibility does your government bear for putting us in that position in the first place? This is really going to help Canada because $20 billion is a meaningful amount of money to invest in the things Canadians need. Standing for fairness is really important too. Fairness for every generation. It's the right thing for Canada and Canadians, and it is working. I have to leave it on that note. I'm being told in my ear your staff needs to get you out. So thank you very much, Minister. I appreciate you making the time for the conversation. <laughs> I have to say that might have been done innocently, like that might have been done just folksy, or it might have been just a bit of a bit of sass, a bit of snark from Vashi Capello. So either way, I'm all here for it. The uh, I don't know. I mean, it was a six minute interview, so it's not like this was some interview that maybe it was supposed to be five and getting it to six was a big thing. But it's not like this was some interview that it stretched on for an hour. And then, uh, you know, basically the staff are just like pulling Christian Freeland off the uh, the studio anyway.
I'm inclined to believe that it had a little bit of sass to it because she's been doing this, Bashi's been doing this long enough to, you know, know what she's doing. Um, but you never know if things slip out innocently. Let's start just at the beginning of that clip though. Um, wow, just a bizarre, just a bizarre response from the finance minister there. I'm not surprised her staff wanted to get her out of that interview. Some of the language that was used in it, I was like, all right, Karl Marx, like just take a chill pill. That was when she's explaining why they need to justify the capital gains tax. She's saying the wrath of the vast majority burns so hot. It's just a bizarre way that we've, you know, the li Trudeau's always talking about the conservatives and causing division, which is really what they're doing here. They're saying, look at how wealthy some people are. Look at what they have. They're responsible for you not having all those things. They're responsible for you, you know, living a, you don't having not as high of an income, you know, not having as quite a good or an easy quality of life. And, you know, when, when, um, Vashi, Vashi asked her question, what responsibility is your government? Mm -hmm bear for that. I mean, the reality is that people are struggling right now and that does lie at the feet of the liberals. I mean, we could talk about this global inflation, but you know, the liberals have a lot of responsibility. They've been printing cash. They've been spending like crazy and people are feeling the effects of it, not even to get me started on their carbon tax, which we saw this week. How much is it that it's taking from the economy? Billions of dollars. So, I mean... Just a crazy clip. Um, I think the I think the the finance minister did not come out of that looking too hot. What's your take, Andrew? Yeah, I think that look, it's a government that is on its last legs and knows that. And the message they've committed to for this budget is generational fairness, 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 fairness. This is what they say all the time. I we were going to do this at another point, but I think it's it's there's a point in sharing this now. This was Ahmed Hassan's uh, latest attempt at selling the fairness message. A damn fine cup of coffee. So I don't claim to be an expert on deciphering what's in the minds of liberals, which I mean, generally, you should be able to figure it out because there's not much in there. But I, I'm I don't even know what just happened there. The, the, the bit, I, maybe this is some like viral TikTok meme I'm not aware of, but the bit was like, we have black coffee and then we pour milk in it and then the coffee gets beige and I don't know, maybe, I don't know, what, what is that beige? I don't know. And then the coffee gets lighter and then you can see we've written on the cup, you know, fairness and Pierre sucks. And but I like, I don't even get that. Isaac, you're younger than I am. What, what's the bit even? Uh, I have to say, Andrew, I don't really use TikTok, but uh, I, ha I I think I've seen that before where, yeah, it, it, essentially the the lighter coffee just reveals uh, the Sharpie. So that's the bit, I think. It needed to be a little more clever, I think, for it to like really be pulled off successfully. Asking a lot of Ahmed Hassan. <laughs> I, yeah, I just don't get the but. But anyway, this, this is what they're left with. It's like Christian Freeland failed to sell Canadians in the six and a half minute interview uh, so we send Ahmed Hassan to pour milk in his coffee because that that'll really like when Chris, when Christian Freeland can't sell the policy, Ahmed Hassan pouring milk in his coffee, that's going to do it. Like this is a desperate, desperate government right now. Well, maybe it was just a distraction. I mean, obviously it was kind of successful. We've moved talking about Freeland's botched interview to talking about the coffee. So they have found some success in it being a distraction. If the whole no new, if the whole like all news is good news thing uh, is is holding, then yeah, maybe it's been great for the uh, the government here. Although I'm not entirely convinced that is true with this particular government. Uh, and I think in in general too, we have to acknowledge the fact that there are members of parliament who want Trudeau gone. Like they know they're going to lose the election because of him. So uh, you always have to look at who the potential successors are and how people are positioning themselves and framing themselves. The one name that comes up in every conversation about this is that of my old uh, Davos chum, Mark Carney. I uh, run into him on the streets of Davos whenever we're there reporting on the World Economic Forum because he's a frequent flyer there. I ran into him once in Ottawa. He was very friendly when I didn't have my cameraman there. Uh, so, I mean, he's friendly. He's friendly all the time, which is why you can tell he wants to run for something because why else would he be nice to me? But uh, Mark Carney uh, has been uh, proving himself to be a very authentic, genuine sports fan that would be up there, you know, with his arm around our friend Isaac. Uh, this was Mark Carney's tweet uh, yesterday on the game day. Festival country de Valdemont. If you can't be in Edmonton, the next best warm up for a big night in the Stanley Cup finals. Hashtag let's go Oilers. 
And there, there's Mark Carney, the former governor of the banks of Canada and England, the UN climate representative with his Oilers jersey that looks like he just put it on. Like, I bet there's a label still on that if you look closely somewhere on the backside, uh, holding up a can of, uh, what is this, uh, Bud- Budweiser? Bud- Budweiser? Uh, oh, Budweiser. Yeah, his staff had to tell him. But th- this is the first time Mark Carney, I think, has ever worn a an Oilers jersey. He did actually play hockey in the 80s, so I'll give him that. But So it's not the first time he wore a jersey. I think it's the first time he's ever held a beer in a can, though. I, are you Are you convinced by this, guys? He is going for those Alberta votes. I kind of respect it. I mean, he knows where they need to pick up seats. He knows where the Liberals are unpopular. You know, he's he's starting early. I, I do respect the hustle a little bit. I'm not convinced by it at all, um, but I, I, I do respect it. Is Budweiser even like the beer that wins you support in Canada? I didn't think it was. At least it wasn't a Bud Light. Well, yeah, that's true. It's been a lot worse. I, I uh, say Budweiser has he fooled you, definitely... Isaac? Like, if you saw him at the arena, would you be like, well, that guy belongs here? Yeah, uh, uh, I I hate talking smack to anyone in an Oilers jersey, uh, (laughs) but I will say quickly, Budweiser won't win you much sway in Alberta. So, (laughs) what's the beer? beer I will say it's nice to see uh, the potential next leader of 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 the Liberals uh, being supportive in any way, shape, or form of Alberta. I I know Stephen Guibault would never be wearing an Oilers jersey. So. That's I mean, true. That's least... true. He knows where Alberta is. I don't even think Justin. <laughs> yeah. I actually haven't followed. I don't even know if Trudeau is on the Oilers train right now. Um, so it, th- this reminded me. I'm not even a 30 Rock fan, but I love Steve Buscemi. So you may have seen this meme, but this is the clip from 30 Rock that it comes from. The clip is like two seconds, so I'm hoping we don't get a copyright strike on the episode. But uh, Carney cosplaying as a sports fan reminded me of uh, Steve Buscemi's character uh, going undercover in a high school. How do you do, fellow kids? What? <laughs> That's basically it. So, Mark Carney, how do you do, fellow sports fans? Like I Everyone's said, so I still silent think, today. You got to jump think, in. I need something to bounce off of. I tried jumping in twice in the last segment. Everyone just steamrolled me. So, you know, I, I've, I've been inclined to give up. We I are making it. space for women's voices. Go ahead, Rachel. Well, thank you. Um, I like I said, you know, I think this could be a good thing for for us at Albertans. You know, we have potential future liberal leader who seems to care what Albertans think. That's radically a radical change in policy from what we're currently saying. Like it can only get better for us. It can only get better for us. The fact that he's willing to, you know, degrade himself to clearly revealing he knows nothing about sports he knows nothing about beer just to try to win over some some points. You know, it could be an indicative sign of good things to come. I think I, mean, I I didn't pull the tweet, but there was one back in the uh, le- leadership race for the Ontario PCs. So this would have been like 2018. I recall Caroline Mulrooney, who's like you know from a very wealthy, powerful family, obviously had posted some video of her eating McDonald's in the back of a car. And it was like, and she had captioned it with like, you know, there was no room at the restaurant. It was something weird. It was like, this is the first time you've ever had this like normal human experience in your life. That was like the takeaway from it. It was, uh, I think actually Chris Selly had retweeted that and said, you know, how do you do fellow boars? That was basically the uh, uh, the takeaway from that. Yeah, it's, it, I'm so, it's so funny. One of the things that I found Trump was so in- entertaining on is that Trump was the only American politician that never bothered pretending. Like, because everyone, you'll get these multimillionaires that pretend to be the everyman. They pretend to be middle class. Whereas, like, Trump, like, didn't care. He's like, oh, yeah, my model wife. Oh, yeah, my private jet. Oh, yeah, my live. Like, he just didn't care. And he, like, he owned it. And I'm like, well, you know, at least there's an authenticity to it. It's like, I I can't tell my one Mark Carney story because I'm waiting until he's, like, the leader of the Liberal Party and that story will be more impactful. But this is the guy that, like, travels back and forth to Davos. He is not the Budweiser drinking everyman. I mean, you know, Trump also loved McDonald's and that he wasn't faking either. He just had a natural love for it. So I think. Most- oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember how much like everyone was so mad when he like served fast food to the visiting athletes and just had that like fast food buffet at the White he House? Served it to everyone, though. Like it was nothing personal to them. Didn't just recently when he was in court, you saw like his his uh, private security showing up with like bags and bags of McDonald's for him. Like it's hilarious. Like the guy loves the stuff. It's amazing that he's, you know, still operating at the level that he is because he just drinks like pop and, and McDonald's. Like I would. I would have been in a coma a long time ago. 
the guy, yeah, and he's like pushing 80 now, I think. There there was a uh, a reporter that I, I'm acquainted with uh, who's with the Daily Caller in the U.S. had tweeted because he was on Trump's campaign plane for some event. And he tweeted like the airplane meal tray that the reporters on the plane got. And it was literally like a McDonald's hamburger and fries and the McDonald's condiments package. So it's like McDonald's is the official caterer, basically, of the Trump campaign now, whether they know it and like it or not. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could eat like that. I think our other, the actual U.S. president now, Joe Biden, needs a lot healthier than that. But I think his mental decline is uh, far worse and far more obvious than uh, President Trump, which probably brings us to our next story if you guys are ready to to change gears here. But uh, maybe we should go ahead and play that hilarious clip from the G7 meeting this week. This is it. Yeah, this is in Apulia, Italy. Oh, no, we're losing Joe. We're losing the president. He's going somewhere. I wish they had just let him and not bothered. And then, oh, Georgia Maloney comes. She's bringing him back in. Being a good hostess for the G7. And then he inexplicably just puts his sunglasses on while they're posing for the photo. Like he's David Caruso in CSI Miami. Uh, So believe it or not, that was not the only Bidenism this week. He was also doing an event when uh, Chuck Schumer, the Democrat senator, was speaking. And this one, I want to tell you what to look for. So I I will do a little bit of a preamble on this. He shakes hands and then look at what he tries to do after he shakes hands with Chuck Schumer. Now our great speaker, our partner who all of these bills. The best part about these clips is everyone around him being so uncomfortable and like unsure of what to do and just embarrassed. I mean, in the first clip, I wish that the other leaders would have just kind of left him and 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 we could have just let him wander happened. off and make it into the G six. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What would have happened if we just kind of like left him to his own vices? Yeah. Um, you know, in this and the second clip, you can see like Pelosi standing there, like, oh, no, Joe, like not again, <laughs> like get it together, man. Like they gotta stop putting me up here with this guy. Like it was so. <laughs> yeah, he's embarrassed. forgotten in the span of three seconds that he already shook the guy's hand. But and it's like these, these things are kind of silly. Like George Bush always had these little verbal slip ups that were kind of fun and everyone like making fun of him for him. But but no one questioned his mental capacity. And, that, and that's where there, there's a part of the Biden thing that's that's actually quite sad, because I think there is a compelling case to be made that this is just elder abuse. This is a guy who's not even in control of his own faculties. That's just being like pushed out and just paraded around like he's some puppet. And then, you know, when he, he starts walking wrong in, in, in one direction, that's wrong. Someone just turns him around and eventually he gets where he needs to go. Oh, there's no doubt. Like, this is not a verbal slip up. Like, I, I have verbal slip ups all the time. You don't have to be old for that. You could also just be like a postpartum mom that hasn't slept through the night in, in nine months. But this is like next level. Like, this is someone who often doesn't know where they are, why they are there, what they are doing. I remember this is someone who the special counsel said he couldn't be prosecuted for having um, government documents at home because he wasn't mentally well enough. He was too old to be, to be you know, examined for why he had these government documents. And we couldn't even remember when he was vice president when they interviewed him. So, you know, this is someone very scary that he's a president of the U.S. I don't know how he's going to handle and handle himself in those debates against Trump. I know he agreed to debate um, Donald Trump in I think it's a, in late summer um, ahead of the, of course, general election. So I'm curious to see how that's going to play out. I think whenever there seems to be a big event, they always seem to give him something to kind of like juice him up for a couple hours. <laughs> so uh, maybe, you know, maybe he'll he'll handle himself all right. But uh, expectations are certainly on the floor at this you point. You think they're giving him some like magic potion backstage that just oh. like, you know, for, for 30 minutes he holds it together and then... <laughs> Undoubtedly, yeah. 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 I, I think, are you, uh, what, what's your expectation of uh, Biden-Trump debates? Yeah, they're doing the same thing they do with uh, NHL players who are playing in the Stanley Cup finals that like tear their ACL and play through it. Like for sure, they're just back there shooting adrenaline up their leg. Uh, they might be doing the same with Joe. But yeah, speaking of the um, how uncomfortable the leaders might have been experiencing that i mean i'm uncomfortable just watching that clip right Hmm. like this is the leader of of the free world one of the most powerful people in the world and i mean i that i've seen even more videos than just that circulating that he is completely lost like if you don't think he has some sort of mental problem let's call it i mean could be dementia senile old age (laughs) yeah uh you know it's it's a worrisome thing when someone with that much power can't remember anything, doesn't really know where they are half the time. I mean, I'm sure when he's in the White House, lots of people are kind of shadowing him, let's say, to make sure nothing goes wrong. But 
Or it's is he even doing worrisome. it? Or is he just like taking a nap and then like Kamala Harris and his chief of staff are running? The, who knows? Definitely not Kamala Harris. Like she's not much better off than him. Like, mm. let's be honest. I think well, that's she, the no, She walks in one straight direction when she's on stage, which is a, that's I never thought, I mean, it's a very, very low bar that we, we need to clear in politics now. Um, okay, th- this is like, a, it's not like a, we should have ended on the Biden one, actually, but I, just very briefly, one of the big changes in X, the artist formerly known as Twitter this week, was the disappearing of the people who like your tweet. So you can't now go and say, oh, well, Isaac liked a tweet from uh, Joe Biden, uh, so we're going to you know, cancel Isaac or something like that. <laughs> I, I, see, I didn't really care because I don't just spend my days trying to cancel people for tweets they like. And Elon Musk, he had put something out to this effect as though this was the reason where he effectively says, if we can put that uh, tweet up here, important to allow people to like posts without getting attacked for doing so. Then I saw who was freaking out about it. And the only one I saw was uh, Rachel Gilmore, the uh, TikTok uh, commentator who was uh, basically sad that now she can't go through and look at people's likes. So <laughs> if, if those were the only people doing it, I think it was probably a good move. Yeah, initially when I saw this, I didn't really care either. And I was like, oh, I don't think this will change anything. But then I remembered I have sort of built my life to be uncancelable. I work for a company that I'm very ideologically aligned with. Um, and, you know, I'm a very obviously conservative, very obviously Christian. So I don't really feel like I have much to hide from. Uh, I also don't spend a ton of time on Twitter either. But I think there are legitimately people who... Well, there are like there's no did about this. There are still legitimately people who have conservative leaning values and feel like they can't talk about them publicly, especially when we look at stuff like parental rights and transing the kids, people who, you know, might not even otherwise be conservative, but are against some really radical policies like this, who have felt like they can't speak about it. And when we often talk about the online sphere and especially X becoming sort of the new public sphere. I think it does give those people who have felt that they have to be quiet in all areas of their life, except for maybe inside their home for so long now, it does give them a little more avenue to just be themselves and post what they want to post or maybe like what they want to like without constantly feeling and looking behind their shoulder, wondering if they're going to be next to get canceled. Yeah. What's uh, what's your take on this, Isaac? Yeah, I think people are so cautious these days. Uh, you know, you're just ever since you're raised as a child coming up with technology, they're so cautious about what they post or what they do online, knowing that it, it could stay with them and haunt them forever. So I think this is good in a in a privacy sense. You know, I'd always maybe in the back of my mind when liking a crazy tweet, be like, uh, what if someone sees this? Or, you know, you never know what's going to happen. What are you liking? <laughs> now I need to look at your Oh, I can't look at your likes now. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the funny part. I never like anything crazy either. I mean, <laughs> what you'd you can. expect. Yeah, yeah, now I can, you can. Now I can like whatever I want. I'm going to be liking either. crazy stuff. Yeah. I'm going to like all the conspiracy theories I see online about Andrew Lawton. <laughs> well, most of those are probably true, actually. So anyway, have fun with it. Uh, all right. Uh, that does it for us for today. This is, uh, this is my pleasure to do this. We'll be back with The Andrew Lawton Show. Rachel's got Alberta Roundup. Isaac's got Daily Brief. You can catch all of what we do and more over at tnc.news. And remember, everything you heard was off the record. <laughs>Does our little off the record outro just kind of make sure that we are not going to be held responsible for anything that we've said? No, no, you're still responsible. It's called marketing. No, I'm not because I said in my opinion, so I'm good. (laughs) We we want people to feel like they they were like eavesdropping on a conversation they shouldn't have. This is as clandestine as your Twitter likes now.